who has known Avicenna or Ibn Sina. His ideas are very brilliant. Many people only know Avicenna as a physician or only because of his dedication to medicine. But actually, he is the very philosopher who has his established concept of metaphysics. Let's explore him with me in this video. Ibn Sina, known to the Western as Avicenna and entitled the Prince of Physician, was born in 980 near Bukhara. In the Islamic world, he is entitled Sheikh Ar-Ra'is, the leader amongst the wise men. His circumstance was very conducive to making him educated. Since young, he had been introduced by his father to the works of Ikhwan Safa. By the age of 10, he studied the Quran, grammar, and afterwards, under the direction of Anatili, he studied mathematics and logic. He had mastered all sciences, including medicine and physics, at the age of 16. Unfortunately, he had not mastered Aristotle's metaphysics. Even though having read the book 40 times, he could still not understand anything. It was lucky for Ibn Sina to find Al-Farabi's treatise entitled On the Intentions of Metaphysics. By reading that treatise, eventually Ibn Sina could understand Aristotle's treatise very well. Ibn Sina wrote many treatises in many fields, including medicine and physics. His masterpiece is Ashifa, Healing, in some 15 volumes dealing with the entire range of philosophical sciences in his era. In Ashifa, actually we can consider Ibn Sina Aristotelian, but we cannot simplify it. Because several of his ideas cannot be identified as Aristotelian. For instance, the theory of emanation, Neoplatonism, as well as the theory of prophecy, purely attached to Islamic worldview. Many scholars consider Ibn Sina to be the important philosopher who had instigated Islamic philosophy to its highest peak. Ibn Sina classifies philosophy into two types, practical and theoretical. The former is science of the virtue, while the latter is science of the truth. It is the goal of the practical philosophy to perfect the soul through knowledge of what to do in order to act in accordance with the knowledge. Whereas the goal of the theoretical philosophy is to perfect by way of the knowledge solely. The theoretical philosophy is the knowledge of the existent things not because of our actions and our choices. While the practical philosophy is the knowledge of the existent things by virtue of our actions and our choices. Ibn Sina also elucidates that the practical philosophy can be categorized to be three scopes. First, it pertains to the concerns in public sphere amongst citizens, which is called politics. Second, it pertains to the concerns of each person in a small society, which is a part of household issues and management. And the third, it pertains to the concerns of each individual as individual, which is called ethics. Thereafter, Ibn Sina still divides the theoretical philosophy into three kinds. First, philosophy dealing with things as far as motion is related to them, both in reality and in mind. Second, philosophy dealing with things as far as motion is related to them in reality but not in mind. And third, philosophy dealing with things as far as motion is not related to them, both in mind and in reality. In this video, we'll discuss the last. Seeing from Alkindi's metaphysics, the orientation of Islamic metaphysics grew crucially in the hands of Ibn Sina. Instead of defending creatio ex nihilo, Ibn Sina believes in the creation by way of emanation. Whereby, God is delineated as the sun, while the creatures are like the ray of the sun. Ibn Sina tried to put forward the proof of the truth by taking an argument 
That being may be necessary and may be possible. Simply, for Ibn Sina, God is the necessary being, wajibul wujud. His existence is must and certainty. Necessary being is such that if something included in it is considered non-existent, the impossibility arises. Contrary to that, possible being is such that if something included in it is assumed to be existence or not, there is no impossibility arising. In another context, Ibn Sina expounds that the possible beings are the same as the potential beings. The possible beings are those whose existences depend fully on the necessary being, because of only the necessary being that can always exist itself. In short, the necessary being is God that always keeps all possible beings in existence by the continued outpouring of the luminescence of its being upon them. Ibn Sina was much influenced by Al-Farabi, but he did build his own thought. Although following Al-Farabi in the affair of emanation, Ibn Sina has his unique thought. He categorizes being into three divisions the necessary being which is identified as God, as he clearly said, if it is supposed not to exist, the absurdity will occur. The possible beings or contingent beings, creatures, whether we consider it to exist or not, it would not imply such absurdity. And the impossible beings, for instance like pure essence or quantity, does not have existence in fact or becomes impossible to exist. We put aside this record. For the first two, the necessary being and the contingent being, Ibn Sina elucidates them further. There are two necessary beings, the necessary beings by reason of itself, this is God, and the necessary beings by reason of the necessary being or God. In other words, those, in spite of possible beings, are made necessary by the necessary being. That is essential for us to scrutinize the Ibn Sina's concept of emanation different enough from Al-Farabi's. As I have expounded it in my previous video, according to the concept of emanation, the first one, or the first cause, or God, thought of himself. Because at the time, nothing could be the object but himself. So that it automatically emanated the first intellect as a result of his thinking. As a test dictum in philosophical problem, from the one, only one can come into existence. In turn, the first intellect as the second being that is incorporeal and immaterial has two objects of its thinking, itself and God. When it apprehends the first one and it gives rise to the second intellect, while when apprehending itself, the first intellect gives rise to the first heaven. In Ibn Sina's perspective, the emanation is different enough. Al-Farabi distinguished between two aspects in the thoughts of each incorporeal intelligence, and each intelligence in his configuration eternally emanates the next intelligence in the series by virtue of one of the two aspects, while by virtue of the other it emanates a celestial sphere. While Ibn Sina added one essential point, the incorporeal intelligences are possibly existence by reason of themselves, mumkinul wujud bidhatihi, necessarily existent by reason of their cause, so, the first incorporeal intelligence has three objects of its thought. First, it thinks of the first cause and then gives rise to the next intelligence, the second intellect. Second, it thinks of itself as the possibly existent by reason of itself and thereby emanates the body of the first heaven while thinking of itself as the necessary existent by reason of the first cause, thereby emanates the soul of the first heaven. The second intellect similarly has three objects of thought. The first cause, thereby gives rise to the third intellect, itself as the possibly existence by reason of itself, 
that bug gives rise to the body of the second heaven and itself as a necessarily existent by reason of the first cause that bug gives rise to the soul of the second heaven and so on the last chain of the incorporeal intellect is the active intellect that governs the lowest realm this bird commonly muslim philosophers identify it as the angel gabriel Avicenna has his answer where the process ceases at the active intellect and does not continue ad infinitum. He writes, while it is true that the necessary proceeding of a multiplicity of beings from an incorporeal intelligence implies a multiplicity of aspects in the emanating intelligence. The proposition is not convertible and not all intelligences containing the same kind of aspects will bring forth the same kind of effects. Therefore, the power of the active intellect is no longer sufficient to emanate the next intellect as those intellects above it. Nevertheless, the active intellect is the cause of emanating the matters and the natural forms of the sublunar world which makes the soul of animals, of plants, and of human beings, and in particular the cause of the actualization of human beings' intellect appear. I think Ibn Sina's perspective on emanation is rather complicated, but I hope you can catch what I've presented. Probably, if you haven't understood a part of it, you can ask me in the comments. See you there.